Steve Jobs famously said that his customers don't know what they want until he shows it to them. And this quote inspired a lot of successful entrepreneurs. But what if I tell you that it should inspire architects also? Because it didn't only make people in the tech world rich and famous, it can also make architects successful. And not listening to your client is exactly what Rem Kulas did in order to win the competition for the China Central Television headquarters in Beijing. He did not design what his client was expecting him to do for this project, yet he still won the competition out of 10 of the best architecture firms in the world. So it's why I think it's important for you to understand this mindset and I want to show you the tools you can use in order to make your design different the same way it makes Apple products unique and successful, the same way it makes Rem Kula's buildings remarkable and desirable. So let's get into it. Welcome to Architect on Steroids, the channel that shows you how to win architectural projects using famous architects techniques. And today we are going to learn how to think different by using a simple framework that will make your project noticed in a good way and therefore increasing by far your chances of success. And more than a framework, it's actually a mindset that I want to show you. And it's this mindset that Rem Kulas used perfectly in order to win the competition for the CCTV headquarter. But it all started with a dilemma. In the early 2000s, Rem Kulas just received the best award an architect can dream of, the Pritzker Prize. And with this fame, it became logic that he was asked to participate into the most prestigious international competition on the planet. And this is where the dilemma starts. Because in the early 2000s, the biggest and most prestigious project was by far the design of the World Trade Center Memorial Master Plan, in which Kulas was asked to participate. But at the same time, and on the other side of the world, the Chinese government launched the competition for the China Central Television New Headquarter, also called CCTV. It was a huge project and they also wanted to see what Kulas could come up with. So he was facing a dilemma, and it was a difficult choice for him, but for most of architects it wouldn't have been, because I suppose most of them would just have chosen the most prestigious project, in this case, the World Trade Center Master Plan. Just imagine being laureate for this project, it's a free ticket for his story. But Kulas didn't think this way because he knew that China at the time could offer him something that New York wouldn't. It's an opportunity to build a bold piece of architecture. And it wasn't obvious for everyone at the time. Remember that we were in the early 2000s and unusual buildings in Beijing were very rare. The nest hadn't been built yet, the water cube neither but Kulas understood that we were at the beginning of a revolution in terms of architecture in Beijing, driven by the future Olympic Games in 2008. So for Wem Kulas, who loves to express new ideas, it was a perfect occasion to do so in a big way. So he chose to say no to the World Trade Center competition in order to focus his attention to the Chinese project. And let's see in the next clip how he understood this transformation happening in China and how it will impact his decision to work there. China is a country that is modernizing. Uh, that means it is on one hand enormous appetite for newness. Uh, on the other hand, uh, it is uncertain, of course, where the modernization will end. Uh, but we felt it was very important for us to participate in a project that could help to define uh, the outcome of Chinese evolution. So you uh, see that he understood at the time the opportunity to work for this new China. And looking back, it seems logical for him to choose this project over the World Trade Center competition. But it's not as simple as it seems to put your ego on the side in order to make a wise decision. You know, I've seen people making this mistake and smart people to go blindly into the most prestigious project without thinking about the consequences. i give an example on that. I know a company, a real estate development company in Paris that fell for this trap. The company was created in Paris a couple of years ago and it was the time that Paris 
won its bid to host the Olympic Games in 2024. So it was an important moment in the world of real estate here because a lot of buildings had to be built to prepare this event. And being able to work for the Olympic Games is always seen as a symbol of prestige. Everyone wants to add this kind of project to their portfolios. So this new company, who had a very ambitious boss, jumped into this opportunity thinking that if they could win at least one project for the Olympic Games, it would be a good start for the company. But of course, it's not that simple. It's not just because you want something that you will get it. And in this case, the company forgot that they would have to fight against big real estate development companies who have a huge portfolio of projects, who have a network in politics, in business, etc. So they were basically the company to work with and fighting against these guys wasn't the smartest move here. And of course, the company, the small company, didn't win any projects. So the first boss left and the new boss who was more pragmatic. They decided to go after small, non-prestigious projects until they built a reputation that would allow them to go after bigger projects. And you know what? This strategy is working. They are building more and more projects every year. So it's always important to remember who you are, what are your qualities, and sometimes put your ego on the side because remember that it's better to win one small project than to lose one big one. And it's exactly why Kulas chose the Chinese project over the one in New York. He knew he would have more chances for the project in China. But now that he chose to participate into this competition, he had to start thinking about the design he wanted for this project. And at the time, everyone was expecting a skyscraper because the project was going to be in a business district with not a huge piece of land available for a project of this size. So that's why everyone was logically expecting a big, long tower like you see in every other cities. And the fact that the nine other architects competing for the project were known for building skyscraper didn't help Kulas, who hadn't built any. So with this point of view, the project that was supposed to be perfect for Kulas isn't as appealing anymore. And facing this problem, Kulas has two options. Either he's entering the skyscraper's war, in which he has no experience and has to fight against nine masters in this field, or second option, he can avoid this battle by creating a new category in which he's good at and which is not related to long, big needles buildings. So you'll see in the next clip that once again, he didn't go for the obvious and easy option, he went for the smartest one. Uh, we knew that uh, the context was at that point virtual, but it would be a new CBD for Beijing. And the certainty was there that eventually it would contain 300 skyscrapers. And that really made us uh, think. It was obvious that in such a landscape and for such a program, it didn't make sense to uh, introduce another needle. Uh, it also didn't make sense to try to compete with height. But what was necessary was uh, an entirely different language and an entirely different condition of the skyscraper. So this is very smart. Because as I said, Kulas at the time has never completed any skyscrapers. And the nine other architects were competing for this project were specialists into building skyscraper. Just to give you an example of the other guys. There was SOM that designed the John Hancock Center in Chicago, the Burj Khalifa in Dubai, and the Jim Mao Tower in Shanghai. Another guy was Cesar Pelli, the designer of the Petronas Tower in Kuala Lumpur. And the last example, KPF, the designer of the Shanghai World Financial Center. So you can imagine that Kulas had no reason to praise Skyscraper for this particular project, even though it was the obvious option. And Kulas wasn't good at playing the Skyscraper competition, so he tried to change the sport people were going to play, so he could fit in and be good at. And in this case, he created a new category of Skyscraper. And you can actually sum up this strategy, this mindset into a framework that I regularly use for the project I'm working on and that I want to show you today. So this framework, it's very easy. I'm going to show you on this blackboard. It's called, well, you can call it the three circles framework, but some of my coworkers, they call it the three potatoes circles because depending on how good you are drawing, it looks more like three potatoes 
than three circles. But anyway, so there's three circles that each represents one person. And so the first circle here represents, I put a C, it represents your client, your client's needs. It can be the official needs, like I want to build a three floor building made out of wood or concrete or whatever, but it can also be the untold needs. Like in the case of the Chinese project, they wanted a building, they wanted a headquarter, but they also wanted an iconic building. So I don't know if they mentioned this or not, but this can be an unconscious, untold need. Like, let's take another example. Let's take Rolex. If you ask a Rolex customer why they bought a Rolex, they are probably going to tell you the official reason. They wanted a watch. But in reality, we know that they also wanted a symbol of luxury, a symbol of success. So this is the first circle, the official and unofficial needs of your client. The second circle here, it's your competitors. It's what they are good at. So I'll put CO. And so it's your competitor's strengths. In our case study, Kula's competitors are good at designing skyscrapers. So they are good at designing very tall linear buildings. They are probably good at other things, but why I'm focusing on skyscraper, it's because I'm focusing on this part, on the part that is overlapping your client's circle and your competitor's strengths. It is where your competitor's strengths meet your client's demand. And in our case, the client wants a big building. That's it. Your competitors know how to make, how to design and build skyscrapers. So this can be a match. It can answer your client's problem with a skyscraper. So this is the second cycle. And what about the last one? Well, the last cycle, it's you. I'll put a Y. This is you and your strengths. So as you see, there is a couple of parts. Either you can be in the middle, so where all the three cycles are overlapping, this is where you answer your client's problem the same way your competitors do. So in our case, Kulas could have chosen to design a skyscraper, a long skyscraper. It would have been in the middle. Then you have the two parts at the bottom. This is the worst part because it is where you design something that your client doesn't want. And it can seem pretty logic to don't do something here, but I've seen architects that design things they like, but they don't think about their client. And where the magic happens, it's here. It is this part. It is where you manage to find a way to your client's problem in a unique way, in a way that your competitors didn't think of or just cannot compete with you. And in our case, Kulas managed to be in the right spot by creating a new category, a category that answers his client's problem and that was different enough from his competitor's strengths. But so you understand even better, let's take an example outside of architecture. Let's take the most famous product of the past decade, the iPhone. So in 2007, there was a market for phones, so the client circuit. From the point of view of Apple, there was competitors, Nokia, Blackberry, Samsung, and these brands strengths were that they could do a lot of stuff. Their phones were very powerful and basically good for business purposes. So Apple looked at this and at the time they were here. So they were doing other stuff, but they weren't answering the customers that were looking for phones. But they saw an opportunity here because as I said, their competitors were doing phones that were complicated to use and not very nice looking. So they were like, what if we try, what if we focus on making things that are nice looking, almost like a piece of art? And most important, what if we make a phone that is easy to use? And indeed, customers were looking for this. There was a gap here that Apple managed to fill and the rest is history. And you can take any successful product you know and there is a good chance this mindset, this framework was used. And it's why the fact that Ram Kulas found a way to make the CCTV building a shape never seen before, therefore creating an iconic building, this was the smartest move possible for this project. And the proof is that 
he won the competition. But there's a danger with this strategy, and the danger is that since you are going to create something new, something unique and of the past, you are going to waste a lot of questions and skepticism. You can already hear his competitors and some critics doubting about the fact that he didn't follow what the client asked for. So it's important mostly when you do something new to anticipate the questions and critics. And once again, Kulas showed that he thought about every single part of his strategy because look how he explains without a word that he did integrate all the parts his client asked for. So this is once again very smart because it answers people's doubts about this project and remember that it is very important to anticipate objections. The more original you're gonna be, the more questions you're gonna raise and in this case, there was two main objections possible. First, some people might argue that Kulas didn't follow the rules, that he forgot some parts and Kulas answered this with a clip we just watched. Second objection possible, the structure is too original, we've never seen that. Is it actually possible to build it? And Kulas probably knew that it could be a problem for some people that prefer not to take the risk of an unbuildable structure. So you might be thinking, well, just ask some engineers to prove that your building can be a reality. And you will be right. But Kulas went a step further not to be even more persuasive. So he didn't ask his usual engineers that were probably from Europe, where his main office is, but he went to ask the best Chinese engineers. Look. We would meet uh, kind of regularly and informally with a group of 150 of the most senior uh, uh, Chinese engineers, uh, the most senior uh, Chinese thinkers about structure and would try to convince them of a kind of logic uh, and the plausibility of our structure. Uh, the skepticism was extremely high uh, and really, and the rigor was also extremely high. Basically, a Marxist uh, engineer wants loads to go directly to the ground. And what we kind of proposed was, uh, in certain way, a method matter to them, something which seemed in their eyes extremely frivolous. Uh, but somehow uh, they forced uh, Arab and us in a greater and greater knowledge of the building so that in the end we knew of every single element how it would behave, how it would behave under pressure, how it would fail, what kinds of earthquake uh, it would uh, withstand. So once he managed to convince these senior Chinese engineers, he can go back to the jury or pretty much anyone and say, well, look, this is your best guys. They are your best engineers, they are the best in the country. And they validated my structure. So nobody can argue against that. They just have to agree. So remember to anticipate every objection possible because it can really help you go from being seen as an eccentric artist to being seen as a professional that knows what he or she is talking about. And you can find any ways to answer objections. Like Kulas, he answered the first objection with a simple video clip and the second one using other people's authority on a specific subject. So you can use your creativity even to find answers to critics. But let's go back to the three potatoes framework and how Kulas won this competition by being different. Because I know that some people might think that Kulas didn't think as much as his client, as I said. They probably think that he's just designing an unconventional building because he's a famous architect and can pretty much do whatever he wants. But no, 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 no. He knew exactly what he was doing because look how he's adapting in a completely new environment. During the same period of time, in the early 2000s, he was working on another project for the residential and office building for the city of Rotterdam. And this city didn't have as much money to spend for this building as the Chinese government because it wasn't aimed to become a symbol like the CCTV headquarters was. So there, Kulas didn't design something as revolutionary because he knew that the client's needs were different. Take a look. 
The building is a building that we started in the late 90s. It's a building for a developer. We all know that uh, these days uh, cities and the state do don't have any deep pockets. So it was a building which uh, from the beginning was defined uh, to a large extent by financial considerations. Yeah, see how Colas didn't fall into the trap of doing whatever he wants, even as a famous architect. He always remembers what his client wants and how he can manage to adapt his architecture to his client's needs. And in this case, he could have designed something very original, something very bold and expensive, but he would have ended up here doing something great, but that's not being built. So he managed to design the building at a wide price and adding a little bit of originality that his client probably asked for. You know, this strategy, the three potatoes strategy, is actually at the core of this YouTube channel because I wanted to create a YouTube channel about architecture and construction because it's what I like and it's what I've done pretty much all my life. And I know there is an audience for this. There's people that like to watch content about architecture, probably like you. But I decided not to explain how to use a certain software or not even to talk about how to design a building or what shape, what color you should use because there is a lot of people that do that out there that do a better job than I would ever do explaining you this stuff. So I created a new branch. I've tried to fill this empty space where I can bring value to architectural and construction lovers and where there is less competitors. So it's why I'm talking about strategy, about persuasion and some marketing, all these little tips that can increase the perceived value of your projects, therefore increasing your chances of success. So next time you start a project, try to remember about this framework, the sweet potatoes framework. Starting with the client's needs and not just the official needs, try to get the deepest needs your client have, what they really want. Find a unique way to approach it a way that your competitors aren't going to use. Finally, answer every single objection. This way, you won't let anyone have an excuse to don't choose your projects. Thank you for watching. I hope you found this video interesting and I would love to know how you are going to use this framework. I am available if you want extra tips on how to implement this strategy for your projects. And if you want to see more of this type of videos, please subscribe, give me a like, and by doing that, you would let YouTube know that this is the type of videos they should recommend to a broader audience and it will help the channel grow and help me making more videos. So thank you for supporting and see you next time.